Hey Reddit, what was your thank god I looked at the contract moment? My wife and I were at a car dealership buying our first car. The dealership was offering special no interest financing for recent college grads and we were using that to finance the car. The finance guy presented us with two options, a three year payment plan and a five year payment plan. The whole time he made it sound like the zero interest applied to both and so we went for the five year plan to get a lower payment. Finance guy tries to get us to sign without reading the paperwork, but we weren't having that. Come to find out, the longer payment plan didn't qualify for the no interest deal and we were getting charged 6.5%, which is a hell of a lot more than zero. We got pissy and threatened to walk out after we realized what they were trying to pull and got them to come down on the price. I know they've pulled that on other recent grads who don't read the paperwork and just sign. Okay, this is just a piece of advice because I know there are actors out there who want to get into the business. I'm a talent agent and entertainment lawyer. I cannot tell you how many contracts I read that include things that are not enforceable by law or are just plain illegal, but actors are so happy to get an agent they sign without looking. Hire a effing lawyer. I used to charge $100 to read a contract when I still did it. It's worth it. Example, I had a client, let's call her Jess. Jess is an incredible talent in voiceover. She, to this day, is one of my best clients. However, when Jess was first starting out about eight years ago, she signed a contract with an agency out of Kansas City. Two years later, she left the agency and we picked her up and showed her our contract. She raised her eyebrows at our rate, asking, how do you guys make anything with such low commission rates? This, along with a few other things, made me ask if she had a copy of her old contract for me to read. So, here we go. First, it stated that the agency's commission rate percentage of actor earnings they get was 45%. The industry standard? If you're a union, it can legally be no higher than 10% and are usually never goes higher than 15%, even for new talent that is non-union. Second, it is stated a non-compete clause that lasted for three years and covered the entire U.S. and Canada not enforceable, and if I'm being honest, I can make a judge throw that out on a dime, but it would cost you a lot of money for me to do so. Usually you don't find non-compete clauses in acting agencies other than a penalty for breaking your contract with us early, which in our agency we usually derive from an average of your earnings during the course of the current contract. Third, this was a fun one. She said she could not deny appearing nude provided proper compensation. I was tempted to hammer this freaking company after reading this. Jess was a very attractive woman, but that changes nothing. Let me be clear to all actors, you have every right to deny a job for any reason you choose. If your agency pushes you into something against your own choice, you call a lawyer or your union rep if you have one. There were about five other stupid things about ownership and her responsibilities, but those are the main ones. Nothing makes me more sick than agencies taking advantage of kids pursuing their dream. They are freaking old age snake oil salesmen who only survive off the desperation of people who have dreams. Being an actor is tough and your agent is supposed to be on your side. It's an unwritten rule of the profession that unless there are extreme circumstances, you hold the line with your client. That's literally the rules in my agency and I fired people for freaking over actors for their own gain. I could go on all day, but please, if you're ever in a situation as an actor or performer where there is a contract, just hire a lawyer to consult and have them read it. It doesn't cost much in the grand scale of what you could lose, and they will always help you because if you're happy, then you'll come back if you need them. Quite a while ago, I bought an extended warranty for something from Walmart. When I got home, I found out they put in an act of God clause that basically made sure they'd never have to pay up. Two years ago, I went to buy a used car. I really liked it, test drove it twice, and went in for the paperwork. They ran the numbers and gave me the paperwork to review. I busted out my phone and started doing the math on it using one of those websites that calculates auto financing and interest for you. I did the math with the website and on my own three separate times while they stared me down. The numbers didn't add up. Turns out they had it set up that payments wouldn't officially kick in until 60 months, but would still be accruing interest that entire time. Screw that. That and the fact that I caught the salesman lying to me on all kinds of things, like this unused space behind the engine is specifically so if you're in a crash, there will be room for it so it won't hit you. Um, no, Jack Butt. It's a low-end model with a tiny engine. Don't try to sell this as a safety feature. Ugh. 
Anyway, I walked out from there and got a lot of passive-aggressive and even threatening texts in the following days. Screw them. I signed up for a gym membership on a whim and got sketched out when they initially charged me $250 instead of only the $90 for the month. I went home and legit didn't sleep because I was so mad I went through with it. I called and asked the next day to see if I could cancel, and almost everyone I spoke to said either no, it was impossible, or only if I moved to an area that didn't have the gym. I checked the contract, and you could cancel within the first two weeks, and I was only three days into the contract. You bet your butt I canceled so fast. We bought a new RV and received a coupon for three free nights at a luxury RV campground park. Of course, to receive the free nights, we would have to sit down with salespeople trying to sell us a membership first. My ex was very gullible and gobbled up the free cookies and sales pitch after they showed us the beautiful photos of their campgrounds all over the state. There were many promises made of ocean views, clubhouses, swimming pools, etc. I was young and he was definitely the one in charge at the time, so next thing I know, the three free nights turns into a full-blown membership with extremely pricey annual fees. But now we can camp anywhere, anytime, right? We headed out that weekend to the dedicated property for the free nights, and it's an absolute crap hole. There is no ocean view, the pool is covered in scum, and the club has the smell of a mismanaged senior home with three residents staring at us oddly. Basically, it's a gravel-lined trailer park for people who live in their RVs. I'm mad, the kids are sad, and trying to play on the rusty swing set. We bailed out that night after driving three hours, and the next morning he tried to cancel. They had told us we could cancel any time. Yeah, right. After rereading the contract, this was a lifetime membership, and you could not cancel it without following their exact fine print instructions of cancellation via certified mail written in the blood of your firstborn. It also had to be done within 48 hours of signing. These a-holes sent people away for three days to a dump, so when you come back, you're contracted for life like a timeshare. Lucky for us, my bish fit got us home within 24 hours, wrote up their ridiculous demands for cancellation, and booyah, right out of there. Then they tried to not refund us despite it all, and I threatened them with litigation, so they finally did. I have a scathing Yelp review about them that gets regular votes for being useful and funny. They tried to get it removed and failed. Suck it, you dirty rotten leeches. Landlord agreed to let me move out a month early since he wanted to lease the apartment to someone else. We had to sign new paperwork to let me out of the original lease and to make me agree to be out by an earlier date. I knew he was a recently convicted forger, so I made sure to read what I was signing. He'd added the condition that if anything fell through with the new tenant, that I would still be on the hook for rent after I moved out. I called him out on it and he said, oh yeah, I just added that part to protect myself. Then he stole my deposit. I still need to take him to court for that. Frick you, John. Went to buy a new phone for $200. The employee told me they were closing soon and asked if I could come back the next day to sign the paperwork. The $200 mysteriously changed to $300 while the document was sitting on desk overnight. Called them out on it and got it from somewhere else. Some workplace that demanded at least four years of employment or else I would have had to pay for those four years as you would pay for a course in case of earlier quitting. My last restaurant job had a non-competition clause in the new handbook. I pointed it out to co-workers, few signed, and it was revised in a week. Went to pick up my car from the dealership and it said by signing the paperwork it gave them permission to lend my information to third parties. Nope. When I went to buy my new car three years ago, the finance department processed and had me sign paperwork at a certain price. Then they called me three days later and told me that their lender fell through and I would actually have to pay an additional $100 a month. I brought in the paperwork with the price I signed for and the keys. Told them they would stick to the contract or they could have their car back with the additional mileage. Apparently, this is a fairly common practice at car dealerships. Beware. I had taken some helicopter flying lessons and was considering switching careers to that. So I found a flight school and applied for a student loan. Fannie Mae was the only one that would cover it. And when I got the final paperwork, the interest rate was higher than they told me over the phone, and the total payment to them was going to be well over $200,000. So I canceled and didn't go to flight school. At my high school, they set up Wi-Fi for us to use. However, in terms of service, it said that by signing into the network, the school had permission to search the phone and look at its contents. I did not sign in and have not to this day. 
Buying my house. Husband signed the paperwork and I went in later that day to sign. I started to read through the loan application. Mortgage lender said, what are you doing? You don't have to read it. Your husband already signed it. I was like, no, I want to make sure it is what I want. Loan was $250,000 at 25%. Yeah, right. Didn't sign it and got out of there. Mortgage guy said he was going to take me to court. I said, go ahead. It would be cheaper than what he wanted me to sign. Took over all the mortgage stuff from then on. Mortgage guy was a friend of a high school friend of my husband. Viewed this great flat and was ready to hand over a deposit when I decided I should actually read the rules they sent me once over again. I had read the one they gave me when I viewed the place, and it was a bit strict. And in general, I thought it was silly to have written rules when you're paying that much. But again, nothing I couldn't handle. Thank God I checked. The rules listed in the email were completely different and included gens like, if you bring a guest to the house, you must put forth a request in writing at least one week prior and must be approved by all members of the flat. There will be no guests allowed after 10 p.m., absolutely no guests staying over. Any guest that comes over will require a $20 fee to go towards water usage for toilets. I'm like, you want me to pay over $1,000 a month for my own private room and not be able to invite people to come over without jumping through ridiculous hoops? Noped out real quick. There were a few other ridiculous things, but that took the buns. We were in the process of selling our business. My wife's car was registered under business. We sat down with our lawyer to discuss what is included in the sale, equipment, supplies, etc. And we clearly told them the car is not included in the sale. Well, guess what? We received the typed up contract from our lawyer and he had added the car along with other things. Thank God we read it and had it removed before signing it and sending it to buyer's lawyer. Was sent a freelance contract for a job offer in the media industry. I was a graduate at the time with two years' experience. Was offered PS 650 hourly pay and with the exception that I must be available to work 37.5 hours per week. I had to use my own car for business purposes but couldn't claim expenses for fuel or mileage. And above all, the contract demanded full rights for the company to use any creative works I produced within two years before the start date of the position. I didn't accept the job. My husband, then fiancé, was getting ready to buy a used car that's often used for street racing slash rally racing. He doesn't do that, but it's a damn fun car to drive, and is pretty much sure to have aftermarket modifications if it's been owned by someone who used it for racing or as a status symbol. My husband had done his research and neither of us were going to be taken for a ride, and even though this was the car we absolutely wanted, we were prepared to walk away. It was fairly low mileage. The dealer, a third-party outfit, not a brand dealership, kept swearing up and down the car was still under manufacturer's warranty and had no aftermarket mods. I was skeptical. I knew that if the car had any aftermarket mods, the warranty would be void for that portion of the car, if not the whole thing, depending on the extent of the influence of the mods. I read every piece of paperwork they wanted my husband to sign and explained to him, but I couldn't find anything that guaranteed that the car was still under manufacturer's warranty. So I straight up told them to walk away from the deal unless they gave us a piece of paper that both parties signed that said exactly that. They did it. Lo and behold, the car had an aftermarket downpipe, a really nice one, that had been installed improperly. Huh? It was affecting the airflow through the engine and could have eventually caused permanent damage to the engine. It was going to cost us hundreds of dollars to either have it reinstalled properly or return the engine to its original unmodified state, which would give us warranty compliance. Yay! But surprise, a-holes! We had a piece of paper that gave us a hold on their balls. They tried to avoid us for a week or so until we left them a voicemail saying that if we didn't hear from them in 24 hours, they'd be hearing from our lawyer. And that's how we didn't pay for having the car restored to warranty specs. We even got to keep the downpipe. It's kind of spiffy. Mine wasn't really extreme, but my GF and I were shopping for houses and we were checking out a townhouse-style condominium. The price was within our budget and the monthly maintenance fees were average for the area. It was an open house event hosted by a retailer, so the property's annual expenses were included in a pamphlet. I found that on top of the regular monthly maintenance fees, around $350, there was an additional expense of $800 every six months. I asked why there was an additional expense if there were already regular fees. She responded that the extra $1,600 per year was used to keep the fees low. I responded that the fees are average for the area and many places in the same neighborhood are already lower. 
Long story short, it was a nice house, but we didn't pursue it further. I'm on board with the idea of condo fees if they cover things that I would normally pay for, like heat, water, snow removal, garden care, etc., and if needed, additional expenses for major updates, like new roofs or doors slash windows. But expecting 12 houses in the row complex to each kick in a $1,600 bonus every year without specific accountability isn't something that interests me. I went to a reasonably well-advertised jewelry store to pick up an engagement ring, knowing that I wanted it to be a surprise and that she would want to pick out her own ring in due time, I made sure that the ring would be returnable for full price and even for a full refund from that store when I bought it for about $900. After the proposal, my then fiancé found a ring she liked better at a different jeweler, so I went to return the ring. When I said I wanted to return the ring, the clerk said, no problem, just sign this and we'll get you sorted out. I read the small paper and it stated something very close to, I now confirm that this sale to be a final sale and cannot be refunded or returned for any reason. I read it, pen in hand, looked at her and said, why would I sign that? She took the slip back, got her manager, and I was able to get the full amount returned via the same way I paid on my debit card. For those interested, it was a People's Jewelers in Vancouver. I notice a lot of contracts have the following clause. You can cancel when your contract is up for renewal, but if you fail to do so, your contract renewed for another year. I set several reminders to prevent that auto-renew thing from kicking in. U.S. Marines. I was enlisted for a program that's five years of active duty, age 19. Get the contract, and it says eight years. Nobody had ever mentioned anything about that. I ask, and the recruiters point out that it's an overall eight-year contract, but only five active, and the other three years I can serve in the reserves or in the inactive ready reserves. They explain that IRR means you are still eligible for service on paper, but have no monthly or annual obligation except keeping your address updated. And that all it means is, if World War III breaks out and they're drafting guys anyway, you'll come back in at your old occupation and rank. So I signed. Note, this was pre-9-11, when we had no major wars going on. 9-11 happened. I do two tours in Iraq while on active duty, and six months before my eight years is up, I get involuntarily recalled and sent to Afghanistan for six months. I just bought a used car, and my wife and I had to bring our newborn. She hadn't pooped all day, and I knew from her doing it the day earlier that a monster crap was brewing. Well, it happened in the finance office, and she crap all over me. Now, just before this, we talked about the $250 cancellation option, how I didn't want it, how I sold cars in the past, and we had a good conversation about it. Well, this jabroni gave my wife a digital paper to sign to reject it and zooms in to help her, but is really obscuring the fact that he had her sign for it. After I emerged from the bathroom covered in watered-down crap, I read the whole long form and caught it. He pretended not to know what the charge was, then he said it will take hours to manually redo. I told him to get to it. It didn't take hours. I didn't know about the signature until after I got home because he gave me a digital copy on that of a USB drive. When I got home and looked over the digital part of the contract, I was floored to see and put together what happened. This butthat saw us struggling with our new baby and thought he could steal $250 from us to pad the back end. A lease I once had said the landlord agrees at the renter's expense to blah blah blah, with the blah blah being a list of deep cleaning services to be completed at the end of the lease, likely many hundreds of dollars worth. First time renter here, moved out of uni res to get my own place so I could take the family cat. Found a nice little apartment for cheap downtown, intended to move in with a roommate or two to split the cost, close friend of mine. The landlord didn't speak English very well, so although he insisted, oh yeah, everything good, everything okay, I wasn't sure he understood what I wanted. When he brought out the contract, it said in writing that pets were not allowed and the cost would increase for more people living there. I pointed it out to him, but he retorted to the effect of, I use this contract for all tenants, those rules don't apply to you. Bull. I told him I wasn't signing unless he rewrote the contract, but he refused, saying he wasn't going to waste time pandering to paranoid people. I offered to write the contract myself and was baffled that he agreed to it. So I wrote up my own contract with super lenient conditions, making sure to protect my own butt. Had a lawyer look at it and notarize it, and now I live with my cat and roommates at the original cost. We were young, my friend signed for a pre-owned Audi and came over to my house. Said it was like 300-ish a month, and in his glove box I read the paperwork and tell him, you know this says $550 a month, right? 
He was clueless, but thankfully it was over a weekend, so Monday morning he went back and caused a scene to give the car back without penalty. My wife and I were three days away from signing paperwork to buy a condo, and they sent us the latest, and we noticed that they changed the interest rate by a tiny amount, like 2%. They said the change was because they re-ran our credit, so they altered the interest to reflect our current credit rating. That left a bad taste in our mouth, so we said no thanks and walked away. The next week, my company got bought out and they moved us out of state. If we would have signed, we would have had to either immediately sell or quit my job. I went to sign up at Snap Fitness, and it said they'd charge a $50 gym enhancement fee every year. They said it would go to equipment upgrades. I told them that's what my monthly fees should be going to. They refused to remove the fee, so I bailed and went to Anytime Fitness. They immediately proceeded to pull the same crap, plus the key fob to get in was going to cost me $70. You can buy a pack of 100 of them for like $20 on Amazon. They too refused to budge, so I backed out. Eventually, I moved to an apartment with an on-site gym, so that worked out for the better. Looked at renting a house about seven years ago, and the homeowner had inserted some of her own clauses into the standard tenancy agreement. Now, this is absolutely fine to do, but they were purposely put into different sections of the document, so if you read the part detailing the security deposit, you wouldn't see her additions as she put them in another area of the paperwork. One clause was that no footwear of any kind can be worn inside the property. Failure to adhere to this will mean the whole property's carpeting must be professionally cleaned. Another was the waiving of the mandatory notice period before the homeowner can come by and inspect the property. There's supposed to be a minimum amount of time they must give you notice-wise before they can come over unless there is a serious property fault, leak, etc., so that they can't just turn up unannounced. She wanted to waive that so she could check we were treating her property right, and if we weren't, then we'd be immediately evicted. I also caught her telling a relative that she registers eviction proceedings upon the start of the tenancy so she can evict them as soon as she decides they've broken her rules. There was a mandatory waiting period between commencement of eviction proceedings and being able to actually get enforcement officers to evict a tenant. Not sure on the current rules of this anymore, as I don't have as much to do with rental properties now. Noped out of that house really quick and got a much bigger, cheaper house, albeit more of a death trap, a few streets away. Had company I worked for was bought by another. The handover included new contracts for all staff with the new owners. I went through every word and glad I did, as one clause gave the new owners rights over any IP I had ever had. E.g., if I had a patent from before I even worked for the previous company, I was signing away all rights to it to the new owners without any compensation. This included if they ever moved into a new area of business. So if I suddenly got successful in another field outside of work time and nothing to do with their business, they were allowed to just start a new field of endeavor and take everything from me. I'm extra glad I did check because they later proved to be deceitful and dishonest, kept on changing our salary payments, super contributions, accidentally forgetting to pay us, all sorts of stupid stuff. Recently, I just started a new job and the employee agreement said I wasn't eligible for overtime, but it was something I 100% confirmed I was eligible for, and it was in my job offer letter. I pointed it out on the spot and HR crossed it out and initiated it. She claimed she must have grabbed the wrong agreement by mistake. I hope there wasn't anything else in the agreement that didn't pertain to me. It did have a forced arbitration clause that I'm still unhappy about, but the job is just a stepping stone for me. Bit long, but satisfying, to me at least. Was leasing with a big apartment company where I had a garage along with my apartment. The lease contracts they cook up are 20 plus pages long and naturally slanted heavily in their favor, and they use them as clubs against their tenants. Generally scummy behavior all around. They moved the restricted access gates because they were tired of maintaining them and kept advertising it anyway, etc. So the contract comes up for renewal, and they, of course, raise the rent on both the apartment and the garage, counting on inertia to keep me there even though they're blatantly advertising a lower rate on the same model for new leases. Now at this point, I'm planning on leaving in a year anyway to buy my house, so I'll swallow it and tell them to write up the contract for me to review. I sit down and read the thing and notice they've clearly left the garage fee off the contract, even though it's noted as being leased. I bite my tongue and read it over, and yes, according to the paperwork, the total of everything was the price of just the apartment, and the total is less than what I paid the previous year. I sign it, fully expecting to hear back that they made a mistake before the property manager countersigns it. 
A few days later, I get my fully executed contract on my doorstep. Now the fun begins. I wait until the bill shows up on their payment website and call them up saying, there seems to be some mistake. You're charging me X dollars when my lease is for Y dollars. Please correct. They tell me they'll review. A couple days later, they call to say, oh, it's just a mistake in the paperwork. You can either pay the full amount or we can take the garage off your lease. Oh, no, no, no. My contract clearly states the apartment and the garage are this price. Please correct your billing. I paid them the amount owed per the contract on the first. Now come the threats. Eviction, delinquent payment, going to affect credit, corporate lawyers. Luckily, I have prepaid legal services through my work. I call up the lawyer they refer me to and send off the contract. He calls me back the next day and says, You're absolutely right. They don't have a leg to stand on here. Get their attorney to provide you in writing what they believe their legal basis is for demanding more than what's in the contract, and I'll take care of it. My favorite line in contracts like this is how they clearly state that this is the entirety of the agreement so there's no chance of slipping in things on either side. The property manager calls me to come visit her in the office the same day and says she reviewed it with their attorney and he believes they're in the right because of generally advertised pricing or some such nonsense. She also implied that the person who wrote the contract was in danger of losing their job because of the issue and if she wasn't more liable for signing off on it. This is where I get to tell her I've also retained legal services and passed on what he said. The look on her face was priceless. She told me they'd take it back to them. End of story. I received a very terse note dropped on my doorstep the next day after saying they're removing the extra charge from my account. I'm happily living in my new house for four years now, but that still gives me a warm glow when I remember it. We were getting ready to move to the U.S. Midwest to one of the U.S. island territories back in 2000. We had five cell phones that I was going to have to cancel, and I was looking at some hefty cancellation fees. Then, I remembered a clause not in the contract, but that was printed on our bill a month or two earlier. Previously, they had not charged per minute rates for calls if they were automatically forwarded from the cell phone number to another number. I had mine set up to transfer to my landline. The notice had two important points. First, they would not charge for the duration of the call even if it was forwarded. Second, if I didn't agree to those terms, I could terminate the contract with no penalties. Remembering that I saw that saved me almost $1,000 in termination fees. I was prepared for a hassle when I contacted them, but the termination went smoothly. Was asked to work Sundays without extra pay. Toyota was going to give me a $750 college rebate and a 1.9% APR for 60 months for my truck. Finance comes to talk saying I suddenly don't qualify for the rebate, and if I did take the rebate offer, I'd have a 5% APR rate and said to purchase the truck without the rebate at 3.5% APR. Luckily, I'm not stupid and looked through the rebate's fine print prior to walking in. I told them to show me where in the fine print where it said I would have to pay that interest rate and why. The guy said, sure, he would show me. Obviously, I couldn't find it. He walked away and came back and said I actually do qualify for the rebate and low percent APR. So yeah, Richard, if you're reading this, frick you. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.